Hi everyone, I'm Susan Mulvihill and welcome back to my garden. It's looking a little bit bleak, isn't it? Just about everything is out of the garden. We have had the craziest couple of weeks weather-wise. The last week of September, we had a surprise snowstorm and it was the first time it had snowed in Spokane during the month of September since 1926. You know, sometimes it's not so great to break a weather record. <laughs> And then a week ago, we had another snowstorm, one that was even stronger. And we've gotten maybe about eight inches of snow. Fortunately, all of it's melted now. But a lot of trees went down throughout Spokane, and a lot of people were without power for quite a while as well. So that was a nasty storm. We've had a lot of temperatures down into the mid-20s. And so I've just been kind of laying low, but all the time I've been thinking about how I have some tasks I need to take care of out in the garden. So today the weather is stabilized. It's supposed to get up to 60. And so I thought maybe you might like to follow me along as I check everything off the list. I thought we'd start in our hoop house. You might recall from previous videos that I'm growing salad greens in here during the winter months without the use of electricity, which is really cool. Unfortunately, there's no water to the hoop house right now, and that's because with all of the cold temperatures, we really needed to blow out the sprinkler lines. So I need to check on the moisture in the soil and make sure that plants aren't getting dried out. Now one thing that I need to look at is how much condensation there is inside the hoop house because once it is consistently there as the temperatures warm up each morning it will kind of rain down on the plants and that is my watering system. So I just have to hand water the beds for a few weeks and then I kind of let mother nature and the condensation take over. So let's see how things are doing. Now one thing you'll notice is that the lettuce doesn't seem to mind this weather at all. And that's because they're in the hoop house, plus they have a layer of floating row cover over them, which gives them a few extra degrees of warmth. So I've got different types of lettuces on the right, and then on the left that is Claytonia or miner's lettuce. And we have already been harvesting some for salads, and it is delicious. Now while I'm in here, I need to harvest some lettuce because we've run out of it indoors. And I use the cut and come again method, which means I'm just harvesting leaves rather than whole heads. And that means that the plants will continue to produce leaves even in the cold, which is great. I love having all of these different types of lettuces to harvest because the salads look so pretty. Okay, that ought to hold us for a couple of nights. Look at that lettuce, it's just gorgeous. Yum. Now let's check on the kale. Well, the kale bed looks a little dry, and so it's really important for me to water it today, and that's what I'm going to do next. But otherwise, I don't see any evidence of slugs, which is great. You'll recall those copper rings at the bases of the plants are to keep the slugs away. Out in the main part of the garden, the only crops that are still growing are Swiss chard and beets. These are the Swiss chard, and they are amazingly cold hardy, but they hit a certain point with lows in the 20s, and they basically just fall over and die. And I can see some frost damage on some of the leaves here. It just has been a bit too much for them. So today, my husband Bill and I are going to snip off all of the good leaves we're going to wash them, chop them up, and put them into freezer bags because these make a great addition to soups during the fall and winter months. Now, at the other end of the bed is where I have the beets. And the problem is their roots are not very big yet. 
this was a second cropping and I've learned my lesson that if you're going to plant a second crop of a root crop you really need to plant them a lot earlier because I just didn't give them enough time to develop. So that's a lesson to be learned for next year. In a recent video, I talked about when and how to harvest your winter squash and pumpkins. And then I emphasized just how important it is to put them through a two week curing process in a warm sheltered location. What that does is it helps them finish hardening off so they'll last a really long time in storage. So it's so important to do that before you move them into your long term storage for the fall and winter. Well, I have been sweating bullets over these guys because it has been so cold at night out here. I've got them in my little unheated greenhouse and I have decided it's probably been just fine. So today I'm going to move them indoors. Wow, I've got a lot more than I thought. <laughs> what a lovely problem to have. So if you're wondering what's what, these striped guys are kusha squash. They make fabulous pies and are a great all-around squash for baking and roasting. These ones are spaghetti squash. They are delightful. They have a sort of a stringy flesh and you eat them like a vegetable type of a spaghetti. These other types of small striped ones are delicata. These are fabulous roasted. All of the pumpkins are sugar pumpkins. The variety is New England pie pumpkin. They make the best pies ever. And then these cute little guys are just mini pumpkins. And I'm just going to use those for fall decor. I just have five of them, so it's not like that was a huge harvest. And then I'm missing, here we are, we have a few butternut squash. Those are also fabulous roasted or baked. Now, one thing I want to mention, just to remind you, is if you have any that have any damage to them, use them up first because they might not keep in storage so long. So you don't want to waste any. Make sure you use those first. What I'm going to do is take these indoors down to our basement. It is about a steady 50 degrees down there. It's very dark, and so that is a great place to store winter squash. I'm going to spread out a few layers of newspaper, set these on the newspaper with a bit of spacing between them, and that is a great spot to let them stay during the winter until you need them. If you do not have a basement or a cellar, you might consider using a dark closet, somewhere that's a little bit on the cool side, but the main thing is just to keep them in the dark, and they will store really, really great. Now while I'm on the subject of storing veggies, I wanted to show you how we store our root crops because we just did this the other day. It's a method that my husband figured out and it's something that has worked really well for us. So this is for root crops again. This would be things like potatoes, carrots, parsnips, turnips, rutabagas, and so on. Not onions. But what we do is we have these plastic bins. You could certainly use a bucket and we lightly moisten some straw and then we do alternating layers of things like carrots and straw or potatoes and straw and they keep beautifully. There's a couple times during the winter where we will need to add just a little bit more moisture but we keep these bins in our garage which is insulated but not heated and so it's quite chilly during the winter months and the root crops store just great. Growing in these two big pots are our two hardy figs. This one is Chicago hardy and this one is Violette de Bordeaux. They are both rated as being hardy down to zone 5 and since we are in USDA zone 5b we thought wouldn't it be cool to grow figs here because they've always seemed way too tender for us to grow. So three years ago we ordered the two plants and we put them on the south side of our little greenhouse. This is down in the ground. And while they make it through the winters just fine, they do die back quite a ways because our winters are quite harsh. And so we never get any fruit off of them and that's been discouraging. Well, during our travels, we have learned by going to some big botanical gardens 
that figs really like to have their roots crowded. Probably the only plant that does, right? But we got these two big pots, we planted them with the idea that we could let them stay outside during the growing season and move them into our garage during the winter months. And I have a friend who has done this and she has gotten figs. So I thought, well, it's certainly worth a try. The thing you have to wait for is for the plants to lose all of their leaves. And you can see <laughs> most of them are gone, but we still have a few attached. And we also put casters under the pots, figuring that would make them easier to move because these are heavy. But this is what we're going to try and I'll certainly keep you posted on how they do. You know we love the birds, right? So during the fall and winter months, we put out a heated bird bath for our feathered friends. And I know you're going to ask me where we got this from, but actually the place that I bought it from doesn't carry them anymore. But if you do a web search on the words heated bird baths, you will see all sorts of different models, including this one. Although we did make one modification to it a few years ago. It didn't have a very strong base and so we put one of those umbrella stands that's really heavy underneath it and that is really working well. But it has an electrical cord and then what Bill does is he puts a long extension cord to it that is safe to have out in the weather and he puts it underneath the bark mulch so that we don't trip over the line. But this is something that really attracts the birds and so you might consider doing that in your garden too. Another thing we put out for the birds this time of year is suet cakes. They are a very nutritious source for the birds and they absolutely love it. A lot of different types of birds eat suet, but especially woodpeckers. And we have downy woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers, and northern flickers, and they love this stuff. We hang it on the tree, and that way it's in a spot where we can see it from our house, and we get to watch the birds enjoying the suet. Now I've mentioned this before, and you might think I harp on it, but it's so important. As I'm cleaning up a few of the beds, one of the things I'm really careful about doing is leaving seed heads for the birds to eat during the fall and winter months. So you are looking at the seed heads of bee balm in the background and cone flowers in the foreground. These are such an important nutrition source for them. And it makes it easy for me to do fall cleanup because I really don't have all that much to do. This is one of our back flower beds. And you might recall that last spring I had to redo this huge area here. And that's because there used to be shrub roses in here. And they had a terrible time with an insect called rose stem girdler. Try as I might, I couldn't get them past that. And so I finally had to just dig them out, which was very sad. But what I did is I put in four different David Austin English roses and then I got some really cool perennials to fill in the gaps and boy they have all grown beautifully this year far better than I even expected for their first year. But there's an element that's missing and that is spring flowering bulbs. You know bulbs add so much to a flower bed and the other thing they do is they give you a longer growing season because so many of them will start growing earlier then you usually have plants come up. So that's what I'm going to do today. I recently ordered some bulbs and I have been waiting for it to be cool enough because if you plant them when it's still warm, the bulbs will start growing and that's way too soon. They need to be down in the ground developing a nice root system and that's all. And conversely, you have to make sure you don't try to plant them when the ground is frozen solid. Well, our ground has thawed out from our crazy snowstorms, and so I thought today would be a perfect day to get started on them. So let me show you the first bulb that I'm going to plant. These are camas lily bulbs. Camasia is the Latin name, and I chose Blue Heaven, which should be absolutely gorgeous. I first saw camas lilies blooming in British gardens last year and I fell in love with them. So these will bloom in May and June and they will grow anywhere from 24 to 30 inches tall. So I'm going to plant these ones first. 
Camas lilies need to be planted quite deeply. Basically, the depth of a bulb planter. And I'm using a long-handled bulb planter that I got from Gardner's Supply last year. I really like it because I'm using my leg muscles to dig the holes rather than my arms or maybe hurting my wrist. And so what you do is when you dig a cylinder, you plant your bulb in the bottom. And then when you dig the next hole, that soil is going to push this plug of soil out and that is what you're going to use to fill the previous hole. So it's kind of like hopscotch. So let me do one over here. Sorry you can't see it. And this ground is a little firmer than I expected. It's probably still slightly frozen. And you'll notice I've got a plug of soil here and that will cover the previous one. Just use your foot to bury it and that's it. So now I have a hole over here where you can't see. Next bulb goes in. When I dig the next hole, that plug of soil is going to fill in the previous hole. So it works really great. Each time I planted one of the bulbs, I placed a bamboo skewer down into the, where the hole is because it's so easy to forget where you planted a bulb and then there's nothing worse than digging a hole for something and you hear that crunch and you know you just went through a bulb. So it's always a good idea to mark where you've done your plantings. Another bulb I want to plant today is a Narcissus called Pink Wonder. It's one of those that has the split petal and I think they look really cool. I didn't like them when they first came out, but for some reason I like them now. But I chose Narcissus for a really important reason. Right now I'm out in the front garden and this is where the pollinator garden is. We get a lot of deer in here because the front area is not fenced. And because Narcissus is basically poisonous, it is not bothered by deer or rodents like pocket gophers. And we have both of those. So that's why I want to plant them out here. And then another reason is this is a north bed. Our house is to the south and daffodils and Narcissus tend to like to face towards the sun. So this way, if I plant them in this bed, they'll be pointing right at our house. Since I only have 10 of these bulbs, I just divided them into two groups of five and then I tossed them on the ground to let them go wherever they wanted to go and then I'm planting them right where they landed. And so I just got my first hole dug and here is the bulb. You can see it's a meaty bulb and it's going down in the bottom of the hole. And then I started my next hole and so I've got this plug of soil that goes into the first hole. Isn't that slick? And I'm going to mark where everything is going just to be on the safe side. So here's the second hole. Down the bulb goes. And then when I do this third hole, I'll get more soil to fill in the second hole. So that's the game plan. There we go. There's the plug down in the hole and plant the third bulb. Well, I hope you enjoyed tagging along with me in the garden today. Hope all is well with you and I'll see you again soon. Nice fall colors, huh? That's a burning bush. Take care.